we just kind of had a wake up call during COVID that, hey, chips are important. And not only do we not have enough of them manufactured here, but we've also lost our lead in some critical places. Okay, Mark, thank you so much for joining us on This is Purdue. Purdue is a global leader in the semiconductor research space. We're so excited to dig into it more with you. Tell us a little bit about your role. Well, I have this unusual title. I'm the Chief Semiconductor Officer for Purdue. And I'm quite certain I'm the only Chief Semiconductor Officer in the US. <laughs> but it's, uh, I think it's a reflection of the commitment that Purdue has you know, as one of the largest STEM universities in the country. You know, we feel it's our responsibility to help the nation with the most significant challenge that it faces right now. So I'm working with an incredibly talented and hardworking group of faculty uh, on a lot of different initiatives having to do with workforce and economic development, also working with a team at the, in the state to bring more of this industry to the state. So walk us through what a semiconductor is. Why is this important? You've said that if we didn't have semiconductors, we would be living life like it was the 1950s still. Well, so what is a semiconductor? So I think most people know what a metal is, right? A metal conducts electricity well, and an insulator doesn't conduct electricity like glass, and a semiconductor is somewhere in between. So you think, what's, what's the big deal? The big deal is that by introducing small amounts of other atoms in a semiconductor crystal, you can dramatically change its properties to make it more metallic or more semiconducting. And that's how we make electronic devices like the transistor, which is the basic building block of all electronics. And, uh, you know, it's made everything possible that we, that we think about today. You know, these smartphones that we carry around, they're chock full of chips. There are a few thousand chips in every automobile. I mean, it's hard to imagine life without semiconductors. Absolutely. And why are they so important? Why is this research that Purdue is doing so important? Well, so the, uh, the Chips and Science Act really has, has three objectives. Uh, one is to bring more semiconductor manufacturing back to the U.S. Because, you know, the technology was invented here. But over the past few decades, we've outsourced more and more of the manufacturing. And we learned during COVID, you know, how vulnerable we are to chip shortages and our supply chains. So we won't bring all of the manufacturing back here, but we need to bring a significant fraction back here. The other is that everything, everything that we aim to do in terms of addressing all of the grand challenges we have will require more computing and more chips. You know, the ener energy, clean environment, health, everything is going to rely on improved semiconductor technology. So we need to continue to advance uh, semiconductor technology, regain our lead. Um, and that's what the CHIPS Act is all about. Now, how did Purdue become such a global leader in this space? Walk us through that. Well, we have a very long history in this space. Um, you know, we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of the invention of the transistor this year. And that's the basic building block of all electronic systems, a chip can contain as many as 100 billion transistors these days. And it was invented 75 years ago at Bell Labs, Bell Telephone Labs. Um, but Purdue was a hotbed of semiconductor research before that, in the 1930s and 1940s. The techniques that Bell Labs learned to grow high quality semiconductor crystals, they learned from Bell Labs. So we, we go back a, a long time. The most common transistor that is used these days is called a silicon MOSFET. Uh, that was demonstrated for the first time in 1959 at Bell Labs by a Purdue alum, wow. Mohammed Atala, uh, a uh, mechanical engineering alumna. So we've been, uh, we've been teaching semiconductor courses since the late 1960s. We've been a major supplier of talent to the semiconductor industry for decades. Uh, the research and innovation has been important. So every Tesla automobile has 48 silicon carbide power MOSFETs in it. That transistor was invented at Purdue, was demonstrated in the Cypress lab inside the Burke Nanotechnology Center by Jim Cooper, a faculty member here. So we have a, we have a very long history in semiconductors. What do you think would happen if Purdue wasn't doing this research? Others would, right? <laughs> Others would step up. You know, it's, um, and I don't quite know how to answer that question. Um, you know, 
We probably have one of the largest concentrations of, of uh, semiconductor faculty of any university in the nation. And you know, it's, it's more challenging uh, to do this kind of work. You need expensive laboratory facilities like the Burke Nanotechnology Center. So it makes it difficult for many universities to really to have a substantial presence in this field. We're one of the few. I think you answered it perfectly. Okay. <laughs> um, we've heard from President Chang about Indiana kind of becoming Midwest Silicon Valley. How do you think Indiana's and the industry partners' investments have positioned Purdue to, to build that hard tech corridor in the Midwest? Well, there's certainly a, a high uh, objective of, of the state of Indiana to bring more of this industry to the state. So this part of the country, not, not just Indiana, but the whole Midwest has been overlooked by this industry. Um, but they're giving us a second look now. And one of the reasons is when you ask CEOs of semiconductor companies, what's, the, what's your biggest worry about succeeding in our semiconductor challenge? They'll say it's the talents. Where are we going to find the people for all of these, these factories we're building and the R&D labs that we're building? And when you look in the Midwest, there is an awful lot of talent here. If you draw, a, I think it's a 250 mile radius around Indianapolis, 30% of the engineering degrees are produced by the universities in that region. So this is really an untapped source of talent. The other thing that these companies live and die by is innovation. And so being located near a major research university, both for their workforce, but also for the research and innovation is really a, a positive, you know, it's a factor that they consider carefully when they're, when they're considering locations for new factories. So, you know, Indiana has a good business climate that's favorable to them, but uh, Purdue is also a, a major reason that companies are thinking about locating here. And Purdue knows a lot about innovation, right? Right. <laughs> so when we talk about this talent shortage, there's the new STARS program this summer. Mm -hmm. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that and how that could help um, get more people involved in, in the semiconductor space? Well, you know, over the, over the past 10, 20, 30 years, as we've outsourced more and more of this industry, you know, students just are paying less and less attention. They're not aware of the opportunities because we've outsourced so much of that. So a big question that everybody has had is, are we going to be able to ignite student interest? Are we going to be able to get them interested in pursuing these careers? So STARS is actually a follow-on to a brand new course that we offered in spring semester for the first time, where it was a seminar course. Each week, a company came in and talked about what they do, uh, why it made the world, how it makes the world a better place, what kinds of career opportunities there are for you, no matter what your degree is. And uh, this is a follow-on activity to give them a hands-on experience with semiconductors and prepare them for internships in these companies, uh, encourage them to pursue a semiconductor path, or earn a certificate. We had hoped the very first time that we're offering these summer, this summer program, we might get 50 students. 500 signed up. Oh my goodness. Now we can't accommodate 500. We're probably doing a few more than we should have the very first <laughs> time. But I mean, I think this is a data point for the nation. Students are paying attention. They're really excited about learning more. What kind of career opportunities exist? Can you give us like a practical example of something if a student, you know, participates in the STARS program, what they could go on to do? You know, there are so many different things that they could do. Um, you know, there, there are sort of three broad areas of activity in this uh, industry. You know, one is manufacturing, and that's not just working in the factories that manufacture the chips, but it's working in companies that, that produce the sophisticated tools inside the factories that do that. Uh, it's all of the industrial engineering with the manufacturing flows. It's all of the raw materials for the chemicals and the materials that go into the chips. Um, it's all of the data science to, uh, to collect the data from the manufacturing process and the, st the statistical quality control. So there's a lot to do with manufacturing. The other is designing chips. So chips have gotten extremely sophisticated. Um, more and more companies are concluding that they need to design their own chips because they're the differentiating factor between products. Uh, High-end, leading-edge chips with billions of transistors. They can take a team of hundreds of engineers. So that's a really 
sophisticated, interesting process with lots of career opportunities there. And then there's the packaging and testing and reliability uh, after the chips are, are manufactured. So really, whatever your, your degree is if, in this, in the engineering, the physical sciences, data science, computer science, there are opportunities for you in semiconductors. Why do you think it's important to get students kind of in that pipeline young? Like, are, is there anything you all are doing for, you know, Indiana high schools to teach them about semiconductor research? Well, so that's an interesting question, too. And there's a lot of discussion is, is going on. So, you know, for the last 15 years, I think every year Purdue has set an enrollment record. Yes. We don't actually have any shortage of students right now. <laughs> Now, longer term, you know, the demographic trends, we need to continue to work on that. You know, one of the challenges that this industry faces is that if a, if a student doesn't have algebra by seventh grade, it's unlikely that they're going to get into an engineering or a physical science program. Right. So pretty much the pipeline is fixed for the next decade. And what we need to do is to encourage more of these students that are on their way to engineering and careers, you know, science degrees, to think about opportunities in the semiconductor space. We had the honor of having President Chang on the podcast. He said, Purdue is the most consequential public university in America. That's what he believes. What, how does the semiconductor space and research, how does that uh, correlate with what, what that statement means to you? Well, uh, uh, you know, I think, that's, I think that's an interesting statement and it's a good challenge for Purdue. Uh, a university that wants to be the most consequential university in the nation should address the most consequential problem that the country currently faces. And that problem is the semiconductor challenge because it underlies everything else that we want to do. So I think the fact that, uh, th that we have made this not only an engineering uh, priority, but a university priority, that we feel we have a responsibility to help the nation address this challenge. That's what the most consequential university would do. I love that. That's amazing. So when we talk about Discovery Park and all of these these companies are investing their their money, they want to be right on Purdue's campus. What is the importance of this, and how can that also help fuel that that pipeline and research at Purdue? For years, we we've kind of struggled here at Purdue. We've been a major supplier of talent to this industry, but they leave Indiana and they go to California, sure. Texas, New York, and other places. Um, so I think having more of this industry close by will, will do a lot. It'll provide opportunities for students. Skywater is talking about having a significant number of its workforce be co-op and intern students. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll provide research opportunities for faculty to work on the challenges that these companies have. So you just, you just look at what um, Silicon Valley has been able to do for Stanford and Berkeley. So this kind of relationship with companies that are nearby is really important and will do a lot for us. That's interesting. Um, when you look at the future and, and how Purdue is shaping this whole industry, what, what do you see personally? You know, where is this going? Or? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> where do you see it going, like in well, your opinion? You, you know, I'm old enough to remember Sputnik and we're <laughs> sort of, you know, it's, it feels like a Sputnik moment. Suddenly, Suddenly, my mother is saying, I'm reading about chips, you know, and, you know, this is what I've done my whole career. <laughs> and, you know, suddenly everybody, you know, is, is aware of this. And we just kind of had a wake up call during COVID that, hey, chips are important. And not only do we not have enough of them manufactured here, but we've also lost our lead in some critical places. And I think when we look at what we need to do in the future and we realize how important it is this technology is, we need to regain our lead. And um, that, that, that's going to be the challenge that the country faces. But it's, a, you know, it's an exciting and important challenge. We're, we're eager to address it. I want to go back to, you've mentioned a couple of times during COVID, we kind of saw the consequences of, mm. of a chip shortage. For our audience who doesn't, didn't maybe know that, can you walk through that a little bit? I, you know, I, I think the chip shortage hit most people when they found out they couldn't get an automobile. Because who, who, who understood that there were 1,500 to 3,000 chips in every right, automobile? Right. And suddenly the auto manufacturers couldn't, couldn't uh, obtain the chips that they needed. So that was probably the thing that was apparent to most people. Uh, everybody was working at home. 
you know, buying computing equipment that's chock full of chips. That, that created shortages. So I think that just raised everyone's awareness about, hey, there's maybe a chip in my toothbrush. You know, there's a chip yeah. in everything. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think the most exciting part of your semiconductor research is? My own research? You know, let, let, me, let me talk, first of all, you know, more generally. Okay. So th this is a really exciting time because for the last 60 years, you know, th this technology has, you know, has accomplished amazing things. But it was done with a very simple idea. And in about 1965, Gordon Moore noticed that every year or two, there were twice as many transistors on a chip. And the electronics became twice as powerful and it hardly cost anymore. And we've been doing that every two years for 60 years. We've just been making transistors smaller. We put more of them on a chip. We do it again in two years. We do it again in two years. We do it again in two years. And that's exponential growth. And it's not as easy as it sounds. I've spent my whole career figuring out how do we make transistors smaller, but we're close to the end. And when you can start to count the number of atoms in a transistor, it's getting very, very difficult to make them smaller. But we've developed this insatiable appetite for more computing, for more data, and we have to continue to increase the performance of our electronics. But this is what makes it so exciting. We'll have to figure out new ways to do it. And you know, people have some ideas. Uh, more and more companies are designing their own chips because rather than purchase a commodity chip that can do anything that you program it to do, if you produce a chip to do exactly what you need it to do, you can get vast performance advantages that way. And more and more companies are finding that that's the differentiating factor between their products and their competitors' products. So we're seeing more and more companies, every automobile manufacturer has announced that they'll be designing their own chips. Oh. So more and more people in the semiconductor, working on semiconductors will not be employed in companies you think of as semiconductor companies. They'll so be like just pervasive. Apple and Samsung, are they building their own chips? Is that a separate? So Apple designs their own chips. Okay. And they're manufactured by a company in Taiwan uh, called TSMC. So there are companies, uh, they're, called, they're called fabless companies. They design chips and they have someone else fabricate or manufacture uh, them. Okay. And these companies are called foundries. They don't design their own chips. They manufacture chips that other companies design. So what do you think in your personal opinion when you go home and tell your family, what's the thing that makes you most excited about your research? About my own research? Yes. Well, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> no? Because there, there's one more research challenge that I want to have a crack at. Okay. And it has defied solution for 75 years in the semiconductor space. And I don't, I don't want any competition. You know, okay. I want to have a it's crack at secret. it. Be, right. okay. but, but I'm looking forward to having a go at that problem. Okay. Yeah. Is there any project in the past couple of years that you've been really excited about or some, a, a student that you've seen really excel some type of story like that that you could share? I mean, we, we produced, you know, so many of our students have gone out and now are leaders in the semiconductor industry. But, you know, one of the, I think maybe the thing that I was proud of that, in this field, periodically, there would be these crises where everyone would think it's the end of Moore's law, we can't go any further, mm -hmm. All right? And this has happened two or three or four times. I think we actually are coming to the point where we're reaching the end. But 20 years or so ago, we, uh, um, we were at one of those points. And that's really when I, when, when I identified, you know, I, I dove into that, that particular topic and we looked deeply at transistors and how small you could make them. And we developed techniques for computer simulation that would simulate them when they're as small as they could conceivably be made. And the result was we can continue to go for a long, long time. And we have, in fact, done that. So that was a lot of fun to be able to look out 20 years and say, no, it had not stopped. We can continue to do what, we've been, what we have been doing for another 20 years or so. That's awesome. So you've been at Purdue since 1980. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite memory or anything that sticks out? I know you just shared that one, but anything else throughout your years here? Well, other memories? Yeah, I have, I have lots of memories. You know? <laughs> uh, I've been, you know, I've been here long enough, right, that it, 
that I met Neil Armstrong and had dinner with him. Oh. You know, that, that was kind of cool. And Gene Cernan, the, yes. the last person to walk on the moon. So I was his faculty host the last time he visited campus. And that was just a remarkable experience. I took him around to classes. I set him on a stool in front of the class <laughs> and he just talked. And it was, it was unbelievable. Um, I was on the search committee that, uh, that ended up bringing Mitch Daniels to campus. That wow. was an interesting experience. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there've been lots. That's great. How has Purdue's uh, School of Electrical and Computer Engineering changed and grown since you know, 1980, since when you've been here? Well, when I came, I remember um, one of the hot research topics was cellular phones, you know, the things that we take. And we thought, you know, this is a really long-term research project. We don't know <laughs> if this is ever going to work out. So it's just, I mean, when you look back, things that you thought were nearly impossible and would probably never happen, almost everyone, except for this one particular problem that I want to have a crack at. Almost. That's top secret. We're not going to talk about it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the school is, well, it, it wasn't electrical and computer engineering then. Right. It was only electrical engineering. It's probably three times bigger now in terms of the size of the faculty. It's probably three times bigger in terms of the size of the students. So it continues to thrive and grow. It's the largest campus, it's the largest department on campus right now. Wow. When, when you think about the Purdue community, you know, you've been in it for over 30 years now. What does that spirit mean to you, that Boilermaker spirit, and why have you stayed here that long? Well, that's an interesting question. You know, people ask me, why have you stayed here for so long? Because, you know, my original plan was to stay for two years. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and, you know, a big part of it is to people. I just, you know, I have amazing colleagues. And if I were to go elsewhere, I mean, these people, the reason I'm successful is because I work with these, these amazing people. And I just, I can't leave them behind. The other is that any time I had a, a challenge and I wanted to step up and do something bigger, Purdue was always there to support me. So. And then, you know, you have students that have been in class, you see them go out and become successful. They come back and we give them awards and they yeah. talk about how, you know, how important you were in their, uh, you know, in their career and their development. And that's, I mean, that's what it's all about when you hear that. Who do you think of when you think of Purdue? Is there a specific person that comes to mind? You know, I, I don't, yeah, there isn't really a specific person. You know, people come and go, mm -hmm. but I, I think there's a Purdue, there's a Purdue Boilermaker culture that just continues. Yeah. yeah. So we've heard that you're a big fan of motorcycles. So we have to dig into the, the personal side of Mark really okay. quickly. <laughs> well, okay, if you must. <laughs> How did you get into motorcycles? Is it a hobby from when you were young or? You know, I, I treated myself on my first job out of college in the 70s. Okay. You know, we were living in Colorado in the foothills of the Rockies and I, I bought myself a motorcycle and we would drive up in the, in the mountains in the weekends and, and uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, when I came back here, you know, life got busy with the kids and everything. And as my boys became teenagers, my wife said, you know, you're setting a bad example for the boys. Oh, no. They might want motorcycles. <laughs> so so, so I, I held off riding motorcycles for quite a few years. And it's only recently that I've had a little more time that I've, that I've gotten back with it. And in, um, in two or three weeks, I'm going to go on a trip in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I had a colleague in Baltimore who mm -hmm. sent me an email and he said, Mark, I woke up in the middle of a dream and we were riding the Blue Ridge Mountains on our motorcycles. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. <laughs> wow. What motorcycle will you be riding? Is it, do you have a favorite one or? Well, I have two. Okay. Uh, I have a Harley Davidson Fat Boy. That's the bike that Arnold Schwarzenegger rode in Terminator 2. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, so that's a lot of fun. <laughs> but I, I have an Indian Springfield, which is a larger bike that I, that I ride when I, when I take longer trips. And that's what you'll be riding with your friend? Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So during the celebration of your service as the interim dean of engineering in March, um, your grandchildren sent some special videos yeah. kind of commenting about what they think you do at work. Mm -hmm. Got quite the reaction from the crowd. Yeah. What did that mean to you? Well, I have a very talented daughter-in-law. You know, she's always doing things like that. And, you know, it's interesting. 
So that was a very special event. I thought it was a little bit over the top, you know, about <laughs> what people were saying about me. I get way too much credit for what my colleagues do. Oh. But you know, the one thing that people remember about that event was the video with my grandkids. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was pretty special. What were some of their responses? Oh, gosh, I don't remember okay. particularly. You know, <laughs> what, what, does your, what does your grandpa do? Well, he scribbles on his computer, you know, <laughs> just things like that. <laughs> um, what does persistence mean to you? You know, you talked about 20 years ago, you thought that the research kind of might be concluding, and yet here we are 20 years later, and it's robust yeah. as ever, right? So what does that word mean to you? Well, you know, I, I think in, in that technology. I mean, there were so many things. I've been doing this since my first job out of college. You know, never things I thought, this will never, ever work. But you just take one step ahead, make a little bit of an improvement, and you keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And it's like compound interest. Over time, it just builds up and, and you can get to amazing places. And I think personally, that's the same thing in my career. I've always you know, you, you feel you're blocked, you feel you, you can't accomplish what you want to accomplish. You know, just try to just try to take a small step forward. And if you keep doing that over time, amazing things can happen. And speaking of small steps, do you have uh, in mind your next giant leap? <laughs> my, my giant leap, you know, the, the next year or two are just going to be intense as the CHIPS Act rolls out. There, there's so much to do. I'm looking forward to things slowing down just a little bit. <laughs> I have a couple of books I'd like to finish, and I have this research problem I'd like to take a crack <laughs> at. Those are the things that I'm looking forward to, yes. We'll have to interview you once you take a crack at that <laughs> problem and <laughs> figure out what it All was. Right.